Jack Shepard was a rogue from early 18th century London who rose to fame as a thief and jailbreaker. He turned criminal in 1723 and within the year escaped from jail four times before he was caught and executed in November of 1724. Jack became something of a folk hero to the poor classes of London, and since his death, his life story and short criminal career have been retold several times by various authors and playwrights. Confessions of the Fox by Geordie Rosenberg is the latest in these retellings, but takes far more creative liberties with the genre of speculative historical fiction and the character of Jack Shepard himself. Rosenberg reimagines Jack Shepard as a trans male character, being assigned as female at his birth, being raised and socialized as a girl, but discovering his true self through the back alleys, bars, and brothels hidden away from the scrutinous eyes of law abiding society. This version of Jack Shepard's story is framed as a lost manuscript rediscovered in the 21st century by fictional trans male professor Dr. Voth who leaves editorial notes throughout the novel that become somewhat of a running diary. Voth will clarify old English lingo, make comments about the authenticity of the manuscript, and is the source of the bulk of intertextual references to a veritable library of outside texts. Jack's story is the core of the book, but sometimes Dr. Voth really steals the show. If you're tempted to skip reading the longer footnotes, I have to insist that you would be missing out on a lot by doing so. Voth's story is far more comedic in tone than Jack's, which provides an excellent contrast in the style of both voices, and the two are tied together thematically, which helps Voth's prolonged footnotes not feel like an interruption to the story of Jack when they very easily could have been. Try not to think of it as two stories happening in parallel, but one larger story being told by two separate voices. Being a story about a jailbreaker, a huge theme in Confessions of the Fox is oppression by the law, which is something that resonates with a huge portion of gay and gender non-conforming people. Now, Police, as we know them today, didn't exist in the 1700s, but the sentinels in this novel, essentially constables, city guards, and watchmen who enforce laws and ordinances, are the same thing in concept. Jack, being both poor and gender non-conforming, is shunned from a harmonious existence within law-abiding society. His mother sells him into indentured labor to a carpenter. Officially, Jack is an apprentice. However, the carpenter keeps him in chains and Jack is forbidden from venturing outside without a note of permission from his master. Effectively a non-person in the eyes of society, turning to criminality is a necessity for him, which in turn drives him into altercations with the sentinels and further oppression by the law. His flight into the criminal underworld meets him with a staple of all Jack Shepard retellings. The character of Edgeworth Bess Lyon, or Bess Khan in this version of the tale. Instead of growing up in Middlesex, Bess Khan is now the daughter of a Laxar sailor. A uh, Laxar is an outdated term for someone of a Southeast Asian background, and a woman who lives in the Fens, a marshy wetlands along the eastern coast of England. Bess grows up in the Fens with both of her parents until the ruling class arrange for the Fens to be drained for development, and Bess's parents and community valiantly fight back only to be killed. Bess, lacking the means to support herself and facing no sympathy as a biracial woman, travels to London where she begins an abject existence as a sex worker. Jack and Bess meet and fall in love early on in the tale, and their relationship forms the emotional core of the narrative. I found their romance to be resonant as well as possessing depth and authenticity. For me, it was a vibrant highlight of the novel. The villain of this story is Jonathan Wild, the infamous Thief Taker General. For those who don't know, Jonathan Wilde was appointed Thief Taker of London, essentially giving him the power to enforce laws and convict criminals. But at the same time, he was also a 
gang leader and oversaw an absolute gluttony of crime in the city. And this dual profession gave him an unprecedented amount of power. Wilde is probably best remembered for his ingenious money-making scheme, sending his pickpockets, burglars, and other garden variety thieves out to steal valuables, and then fencing them back to the owners claiming that he had arrested the burglars and found the stolen goods. I absolutely love it because as far as criminal conspiracies go, that is incredibly straightforward. Something right out of a folklore villain. His story is also intertwined with the story of the historical Jack Shepard, who was able to slip out of Wilde's clutches on multiple occasions. It really does sound like a folk story when summarised, and I absolutely love that the style of Confessions of the Fox leans into this in some parts. The novel uses dramatic storytelling tropes that emphasize the folktale aspects and make the story an absolute joy to witness unfold. It is as fun as it is fiercely intelligent, and Rosenberg's precision with which he interweaves the themes, historicity, and intertextual references while always maintaining a dramatic flair is nothing short of masterful. The Homer discussion bloomed louder as the denizens gathered round the urchin. Only the two soused remained seated. The two soused and Bess, who had returned to Jack's lap. A full body sweat emitted from him. He wanted to stand and aggle for his own bottle. You know who's running the sentinels. Bess turned to look at Jack now. Don't you? He shook his head. Jonathan Wilde, thief catcher general. She proclaimed, loud enough for the pub to hear. The lizardy fuckwit, reprised Jenny, nose deep in a mug of ale. The lizardy fuckwit. Bess faced the group again, most of whom congregated round the urchin selling plague remedy. <laughs> and look, this so-called plague's a colonial furor too. An excuse to send the Bombay Navy down the Coromandel coast to war against the Froglanders and the French and whoever else is vying for fortune. It's all bollocks, an imperial trick. This worry over faction from the East, constructed to cover up something else. But what? Mouthed Aurea Jack. To cover up what? So, I go by Dean of Surveillance Andrews' office today. The library looks... grander than ever. <laughs> Relieved of a vast proportion of its books, the space has really blossomed into the spectacular... Vacant anime of an insurance tower in a second-rate city. When I arrive at Dean of Surveillance Andrews' office, he's got company. This guy in a drab gray suit is sitting in one of the chairs opposite the desk. Ursula is in the other one. They hauled Ursula in here just for associating with me? Jesus. Welcome, says Dean of Surveillance Andrews. He doesn't stand up. This book has a lot of sex. And if you're familiar with the books that I usually cover on my channel, you know that's definitely saying something. For the most part, I think it's actually very good. Sexuality and gender expression are incredible tools for characterization, and being privy to the visceral and intimate aspects of the protagonist's private lives lends itself to an evocative and holistic portrait of the hearts and minds of the characters. Dr. Voth comments at one point about how the manuscript isn't voyeuristic because it lacks a vivid description of the character's anatomy, and I just laughed. <laughs> I didn't buy that for a second. This novel is incredibly voyeuristic. Being able to stomach the sexual content will be a barrier to entry for some readers, so reader discretion is advised. Now, it's definitely not as bad as an author like Christos Cholkis, but... <laughs> You know. The thing that put Confessions of the Fox over the top for me was its revolutionary spirit and optimism. The backdrop of London gearing up into the industrial era and the rise of capitalism that robs the fen dwellers of their home and scars the land, in addition to the formation of what would eventually evolve into our modern police forces, this novel is flagrantly political, depressing at times, but the latter parts of Dr. Voth's story have a cheeky subversive quality to them that lends to a fabulous optimism. I won't spoil it for you, but I'll just say that the novel's final act had me ready to declare this as now 
one of my favorite books that I've ever read. I will stand by that. This book is one of my favorites. Confessions of the Fox is a fantastic novel that I highly recommend to adult readers interested in speculative historical fiction. It's an incredibly thematic book with rich characters and an entertaining story. But on top of that has a fiercely intelligent academic quality introduced by the amazing addition of a fictional editor who adds an entire new dimension to the text that pays off in a big way by the end. This book has everything I love in a novel. It's well written, it's well well told. It plays with literary format. I honestly recommend this book to you even if you haven't delved at all into LGBT fiction. It's just very good literature. The novel was published internationally in 2018, so it shouldn't be difficult to find in bookstores. I live in Melbourne, Australia, and I was able to find copies of this book available and on display at several independent and major bookstores around the city. However, if you have trouble finding this book in stores, I've linked some online book retailers in the description that I recommend, such as Better World Books, Alibris, and Blackwells. However, I do encourage you to first try purchasing the novel from a local independent retailer Taylor, if possible. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can help me out by doing all the things that help my channel grow. Subscribe, click the bell, and share this video with your friends or on social media. I would appreciate that a lot, and thanks for watching.